Amen. Thank you, sweetheart. Let's take our Bibles now, and we will turn to the book of Acts in chapter 5. The book of Acts in chapter 5. You can expect whenever God is doing something, uh, we realize that there's that the Satan is alive and well on planet Earth. And whenever God is doing something, you can expect Satan to be around. And you'll see this throughout Scripture. Whenever God is doing something, that's when the, it seems like the, the forces of Satan really start coming to fore. And uh, for instance, angels and uh, demons and so forth that, uh, that you can see them um, as they're, they're dealt with. We know there's a lot of demonic activity when the Lord Jesus was on earth. And of course, a lot of d- demonic activity um, when the church got started. And uh, now in the last days, we know as before the Lord comes that we see Satan that uh, looks like he is, uh, you know, he is not hiding himself anymore in our, in our country. It uh, used to have to be very subtle, but now all of a sudden we're seeing Satan making all kinds of inroads and people even proudly claiming to be Satanist or atheist and even in our schools and so forth, if you really want to an education, many of us that haven't been in schools for quite a while. I uh, sub- substitute taught in um, a high school in Michigan. It's just amazing some of the kids who were into devil worship there and, and so forth. And we got it all in our entertainment and so forth. And of course, now we're getting it into our government. And how sad to see all that. And so we see that the forces of Satan are coming out in full force against uh, the church as it, got st- as it gets started. We see that he did this externally, and we're going to see this now as it gets worse and worse. Uh, the, it goes downhill in the book of Acts as far as the, the disciples are warned not to preach in chapter 3. And then in chapter 4, we see that, uh, that uh, they were imprisoned, and then we're going to see they're, they're going to be scourged, and as the chapters go on, we're going to see that uh, James is killed, uh, one of the apostles, and then Stephen, one of the deacons, is killed. And then a lot of other people are imprisoned and so forth for the cause of the gospel. And so we see now in chapter 3, or chapter 5, excuse me, in verse, uh, verse 12, and it says, and, and through the hands of the apostles, now this was after that uh, great climactic time with uh, uh with Ananias and Sapphira, where the Lord had to, to really make an example to the church of sin and how to, uh, to deal with it. He said, through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared to join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasing, uh, increasingly added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women so that they brought the sick out of the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. And also a multitude gathered from surrounding cities uh, to Jerusalem bringing sick and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Now, Father, we pray that you will bless the reading and the preaching of your word this morning. Lord, may we understand the, the power of the gospel and the boldness that you want to give the, to us who believe. And may we boldly proclaim your word. May we sweetly well, proclaim that word. But, oh, Lord, may it uh, go forth uh, in a world now that is that is seemingly more and more dominated by by the adversary Satan, but Lord, we know that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And so, Father, we pray that we would learn how that you dealt with the beginning beginning of the church, and how that you're going to deal in the future. And but yet, Lord, as we look forward to you coming again, we realize that great promise that you gave to Peter and to the disciples, that yes, you are in heaven today, and we pray to you, but yes, you're coming again for us to be with you forever. Bless your people now as we look into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we know, 
we see that the Lord had a special dispensation and when God was changing the order of his household, which that's technically what the word uh, dispensation means is that God is changing things. He's changing the furniture around. He's changing thing, uh, the system around. No longer will it be the church and, and or excuse me, no longer will it be Drew, the priest and the, the offerings of bulls and goats, but it was going to be the church and uh, that God is going to send forth the, his message and we are the oracles of God as the Jew was in the Old Testament. Now we are the mouthpiece of God in this age. Now in getting started, as we have seen and we've talked about several times about uh, when God changes things, many times he will give signs and wonders or he will do certain things uh, that will show that uh, he means business. For instance, back when Moses uh, gave the law and you remember it came down the, mount, uh, the mountain and if anybody would touch that mountain, they, they would die. And then a little bit later on, he talked about uh, the Sabbath day and keeping it holy. And some boy went out and started gathering uh, sticks and he was, he, was thinking, he was severely judged. And also we see that, that God did these things throughout scripture uh, whenever he was changing the order of the household. But now we see that uh, he is using the apostles and by the hands of the apostles, they did things that I can never do. And that is, uh, as I'm just a pastor, I'm not an apostle. And we see that the apostles had many signs <clears throat> and wonders. Uh, signs from whom? From God. And wonders among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. So they were still, notice they're still in the temple or around the temple, preaching the word of God to Jews. Now, we know that, and God gave them all kinds of, of opportunity as well as uh, authentication to these Jews that were there and said, yes, these people are backed up by the power of God in very ostensible ways that they could see. Now, I like to tell people, I believe that God, the, the, the God that uh, Peter and the rest of the apostles had uh, is the same God I serve today. And it's the same power but it's, it's administered in different ways. The greatest thing that someone could do is come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. That's the greatest miracle on earth. And so we see that the God changes hearts and so forth. He doesn't use the same means. And as we've talked about uh, the faith healers and so forth today, I don't believe that uh, God has given us that opportunity today. As we said last week, um, if, there, if you have the power to bless and healing, then you also have the power to curse as Ananias and Sapphira. So if these faith healers will show me some Ananias and Sapphira's around, then I might believe that they have power in all those areas. I like to tell people, you know, even these uh, d disciples or these apostles raised people from the dead. Remember Eutychus, he's one of my favorite men in scripture. He, he, remind, he had to be a Baptist because he went to hear Paul preached. Now he was, in fairness, he was a slave and he probably worked all day and, and Paul was preaching late into the night. And remember what he did? He was sitting on the, the windowsill listening. Now, I'll, and some of you name you, but uh, if you go to sleep in this and you fall off and break your head, I cannot do what Paul did. He raised him from the dead. And we don't have that power today. That has ceased. Uh, now, if I could, then you better realize that uh, there's a big change coming because God's about ready to change things. But uh, we don't have that power today. Now, in the tribulation, God is going to give a certain group type of authenticating power. Isn't that interesting? Because why? Because Satan is going to be loosed on the earth. And God, so if he's going to be loosed in such a visible way, then God is going to have forces to fight him. And, it's, and the only place in Scripture that you'll ever see angels preaching to people the, the glories of God is in the book of Revelation. So even the angels are preaching to the people the glory of Revelation. So we see that uh, when God is changing things, many times he will bring things out in the open to say, this is real, and I will show you by signs and wonders. And then he backs off. We don't need signs and wonders today because we've got the Holy Spirit. Whether there's prophecies, they shall cease. Whether there's healings or whatever, they shall cease. Why? Because that which is perfect is come, and that's what we call the Word of God. 
And so we preach the word of God today. And uh, the power that God has to change lives is the same power inwardly that it was, but the outward power is not there because we don't need it because we have the Holy Spirit. And so we, it says that they, they did this by many signs and wonders and that multitudes around, notice around the, the area had come and uh, notice, and uh, one time I was, I had a, a very well-known evangelist in our church or came to a church and, uh, and he was preaching for me. But in the mail that day, I got a little prayer cloth and it was something where I put on, uh, I mean, if you put it on your head, then it was supposed to heal you if you prayed a certain prayer. You ever, you ever, anybody get any of those type things? Maybe it's down south, but that's one of those things where I got a little prayer cloth from some television evangelist. And if I just put it on my head and prayed a certain prayer, then I wouldn't have headaches anymore. Well, he had a headache. And so I gave it to him and it didn't do any good. But uh, maybe he would. But, uh, you know, the just crazy things like that that are out there today that uh, folks don't get caught up in them. Uh, I had, uh, I've had widow ladies send me letters and they got them from Oral Roberts or whatever saying, the Lord told me uh, and that, uh, that uh, you were going to, anyway, the idea was that they were going to give money to, to his ministry. Well, the thing about it was written to their husbands and their husbands had died five years before, you know, or whatever. So all kinds of, of idiocy are out there that unfortunately a lot of people get caught up in. And so, but here we see that this was a specific purpose and that purpose was the church was getting started and God was showing to the Jew. You will notice time after time that Jews are present. Remember what we say about the gift of tongues? Every time in the book of Acts that you see tongues used, it's a verification not to the Gentiles, but to the Jew that God was doing something in someone's life. You'll always see that. And so the interpreter, the two things in a church, if you will go and hear people talking in tongues, there, there should be somebody who could understand the language. And that's going to be a definite language, German, Italian, French, or whatever. And then the second thing is going to be a Jew. And those are the, it's because sign, this sign was a sign to the Jew. And so uh, we see that in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And so we see that the God used various signs and wonders. Because, you say, well, why did God do it? Because God wanted to. Does God have to make sense to me? No, God, God is my sovereign. I, he could do what he wants to do. And if I could understand God, he'd be a pretty small God because I got a pretty small brain. Amen? No, 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 don't amen that. But you, <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying. But uh, we all got small brains. Boy, I put my foot in my mouth there. But uh, again, we see that, uh, that these things were happening for the glory of God. The one thing that I do see here, though, that is prevalent today, and notice, and the multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing the sick, and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Two classes of people we see in this passage in chapter 5 is you have those who are the people that are the victims and the people that are, that are really the ones that are, that are the worst victims of unclean spirits. And then you see the, people, the spiritual wickedness in high places that isn't so obvious. It's like uh, the drug kings. They drive the big car and all that. But the people that are really into drugs are the ones out on the streets with uh, begging for needles and all the rest. It's the, uh, the liquor crowd who uh, uh, the advertisements will have them on yachts having a great time, having you're only going to go around life and uh, once in life, live with all the gusto you can. But they don't show you the guys who yet to uh, pick their heads out of the plastic chairs to keep them from drowning in their own vomit. In the same way with, uh, with all the perversions today where we have these people in, in high places with the, all the different perversions that are going on and we can name all the, the things outside of marriage that are going on, but they don't show you the devastation that is caused psychologically and physically and 
poor children that are growing up so confused because they don't know even who, what a mother, what a, a man or a girl. They're being mutilated, both mentally as well as, as spiritually. And when you deal with those people as a pastor, or if you've dealt with them in your own family, you realize they've got problems that are so big that no human force is going to take care of them. And it's only going to be the power of God that could bring them out of it. Oh, it looks all glorious. And, uh, you know, you know, all the Hollywood stars and all these people that are talking about freedom and, and uh, they march on the streets for their rights and whatever. But they don't see the devastation and the anger and the frustration that, uh, that I've seen even in trying to deal with people that are living those type of lifestyles. And so we see the Sadducees, and that's where we see this group of people. Notice that the ones that really came and were tormented by unclean spirits and with all the sin that was going around, they were healed. And folks, that's what I want to see, is I want to see people that are living in some of these lifestyles that the miraculous, I want to be able to, I mean, I love it whenever someone tells me, you know, Pastor, you don't realize what that person was until, I mean, until they started coming to your church or they got so they don't realize what salvation is. And they'll, but, but hey, folks, isn't it that way it should be? I mean, Pastor, from death to life, I tell one of my favorite moments in the ministry was we were playing softball one time and we had the men out there and I, little lady was standing there where we had an eight foot fence and she uh, was standing there. She was about halfway down the fence. <laughs> she was about four feet tall, it looked like. But uh, she was an older lady. And I went over and started talking to her. And, I said, and she had a tear in her eye. I said, is there something wrong that we can help you with? And she said, no, your shortstop out there, uh, I've known him since he was a little child. And it's just so good to see that he is saved and living for the Lord today. And uh, she said, I prayed for him over and over, and he really didn't have much of a chance growing up. And I never thought he'd be saved, but here he is out here in your church. And I'm going, you know, those are the things you want to hear. Those are the things that, uh, that you want to see. People first passing from death into life, from the power of Satan into God. Uh, drug addicts and people that uh, you had no idea of uh, the, uh, the backgrounds that they've had. One of my favorite couples was a couple who they wouldn't tell me uh, when they, they tell me when they got married, but they didn't tell me where. Until later on, they told me we got married in a bar, you know, and all, and all these things that, you know, but their lives were straightened out and, and, and what a blessing it was to know them. But, you know, but you'll always have the people like the high priests and the Sadducees. You'll always have those who are always trying to bring them back down, like the, the poor girl that, that Paul got saved in the book in Ephesus. And remember her? She was into all kinds of sordid uh, underworld stuff with demon possession and you can imagine the drugs and the immorality and all that stuff that comes with it. And she was marvelously saved. Well, what happened? All the businessmen of the city got mad because they're going to lose money off of it. And you realize the drug trafficking and all the garbage that's going on today and people are making money, the drugs, the, 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 all the things that people that are in high places and religious places are doing what they're doing. And so you have two classes of people. You have those who are tormented, and then you have those who are the very ones that are, are, that are tormenting. But we see now the high priest in verse 17 uh, rose up. And remember the high priest were the, were the Annas and the Caiaphas. Uh, they were Sadducees. They were political animals, much more, and you will see, as we said in the book of Acts, is the Sadducees who give the church who gives the church fits, not the Pharisees. The Lord uh, Jesus preached to the Pharisees, and many of them got saved. But you'll see the Sadducees, who are the political class, are the ones who really are the oppressors in the book of Acts. And notice they were filled with indignation. Hey, listen, you're running out to our territory. Now, if if your friend was marvelously healed by just Peter passing by this shadow, would you go out and hit clobber Peter because your friend was healed? These people would. Peter, you have no business doing that. I mean, isn't it sad that that's the way the world is? Oh, I remember one lady that uh, 
her, we, we led her husband, or led her daughter, and then her, her husband later on to the Lord, and they were just really growing in the Lord. Uh, they were growing by leaps. They had children, were just loving church. Uh, the boy would go out, and they would... Uh, uh, they would play in the yard and they would uh, pretend to be the preacher and they would preach and then other people and all kinds of things like that. And, but that mother-in-law just could not stand the fact that her daughter was saved and going to church. And I talked to her one time and she claimed to be a Christian and all that. And I, I said, but you know, look what's happening. Their marriage is back together. They're growing. He's prosperous. They're coming out of all the drugs and everything else that they've had in their lives. And she said, yeah, but they don't go to the parties with me anymore. I'm going, you know, she was just so upset that, that her children were not doing what she wanted them to do in the area of sin. And she had an influence on those children. Unfortunately, uh, over years, I saw how that she had more and more influence and it wasn't long, I mean, it was several years, but the last I heard of that family, they were divorced and all that. I guess she's happy now. I guess the devil's crowd is happy whenever they see people that uh, are coming out of sin. They hate that, but they would much rather have them wallowing. I guess misery loves company and how sad that is. And you'll have it in your life. You know, why? <laughs> if you're saved, you'll have people that are, living immoral lifestyles and they laugh at you for, for trying to live virtuous lifestyles. It's just something about the sinful person, no matter if they're in power or if they're just uh, your peer or people that are, that are below you, whatever. But here we see that the high priest, I mean, the people that should have known better, the people that really should have had the spiritual care and concern for their people as their main object, are the very people that resent the fact that these people are being healed, their lives are being straightened out, they're happy, and things are working so well in their lives, and yet they are filled with indignation. And they laid hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. So we see now there the church is growing, but now we see there's going to be three different waves of persecution. Remember we said that the two, I guess you got three different turns or whatever. The screws are going to get tighter and tighter. Uh, and, the, and the persecution of Satan is going to become stronger and stronger. Just like we're seeing in our country today, isn't it? Where we're seeing little by little that the persecution is coming more and more. But we see then, uh, we see that, uh, but, at, but we see they were thrown in prison. But notice angelic activity. An angel, and this isn't the last time we see this. Remember, later on, we're going to see Peter is let out. Now, bear in mind, notice how blind these forces of doctors, uh, dark, darkness are. Notice how blind they are. Because they see these people healed, and they don't believe. They see, or they see the, the, they're surprised. The prison doors are open, and they're, they're brought out. And the angel told them to go and preach to the people, in the next morning. So they get up and they go the, uh, early the next morning and they start preaching at Solomon's porch again. That was a big area off to the side uh, or on the, the, uh, the side of the temple, a great congregation area. You could put a couple of thousand people in kind of, you know, or several hundred people in that area at one time. Uh, and so they were preaching there. Now, wait a minute, we just put them in. You know, so we see that uh, when they heard it, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together and with the elders and the children of Israel, and they sent to the prison to bring them out. So first of all, they were imprisoned, and yet the, the, the uh, and that was the simple thing. And yet we see that uh, the priest had greater designs and the Holy Spirit and the angels, the very angels, are protecting these people, but they didn't see it. Notice in verse uh, 22, But when the officers came and did not find them in prison, they returned and reported, saying, That indeed we, find, uh, we found the prison shut securely, and the guards standing outside before their doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. And when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, 
they wondered uh, what, uh, what the outcome would be. Now, wait a minute. If I put someone in prison and the guards are standing there and they could vouch for one another that they were in prison and yet these people are out preaching, would, would that kind of make you wonder what's really going on? Or would I be so blind that I would not even see it? Someone says, well, if, the, if I see, if the Lord would, uh, if the Lord co- creates this miracle, then I'll believe God. No, you won't. You know, I've seen uh, <coughs> in hurricanes, been through several of them. But it, uh, I remember, you know, oh my, uh, <coughs> the Lord allowed this to happen uh, in my house. And the only thing that was left was the Bible on the table. And boy, that, well, I really believe God. Okay, great. Let's go to church. And back uh, within two days, they were back doing what they, they used to do. Lord, you get me out of this foxhole, I'll live for you. Oh, I just said that under distress. And I literally know two men have said that. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter if the Lord struck, uh, you know, if he, if he struck uh, the seat right next, or over here on the side, uh, scare us to death, but uh, that wouldn't make people believe. If they said, well, if I find Noah's Ark, well, you could find Noah's Ark and you could find all the hay in it and everything else and have Noah's Ark written over the door of it. And if, uh, and that does, but simply because you saw that, unless the Holy Spirit enlightens your eyes and you're willing to, to say there's a God in heaven, you're going to be blind. And notice these people were blind because they rejected the God of heaven. And no matter what God did, they could not see. They were blind and they could not see. The pauper and the people down there that were tormented by sin saw, but the very people with their pride and their arrogance and their blindness did not see, no matter what God did. That's one of the most phenomenal things in Scripture I see, is, and, and in life, where you'll have sometimes in ministry and in preaching, you'll hear, oh my, that was just the message that so-and-so heard. They go out the door and didn't bother them all. But a person that is the, that's really sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and they, they come in with tears in their eyes and God is really dealing in their lives. And you're saying, wait a minute, what the person that God ate that, you know, whatever, you, they didn't even see it. It passed right over their heads. Whenever you're witnessing to somebody and you've, you're witness, and, and then their pride and then their arrogance are just because of their lackadaisical attitude. No matter what you say, you can't say you can't save them, and that's why I like that little statement. I think we put in the bulletin this week. We are responsible for the message. We are responsible to deliver that message. We are not responsible for the results. Now we do it the best we can, and we don't want to be re- responsible for the distracting from the results. And so we want to be all things to all people that we may win some. But folks, you cannot get a person saved who is determined not to be saved. And how many of these Sadducees had seen all the miracles that Jesus had done? All the miracles now that the apostles were doing, and they still fought the Lord. That is one of the most phenomenal things that I see. How much, why is it that certain people can see, and they were blind, but now they see, and the people that are blind and refuse to see. And here we have the said, no matter what they saw, no matter what they heard, no matter, you know, the obvious miracles that, that are happening, even probably within some of their own families. And they still are just adamantly opposed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see they're imprisoned. And then now we see that they're rearrested. And notice in verse uh, uh 26, it says, And the captain went uh, of the officers and brought them without violence. Now we, I mean, the people outside, they were popular, so they couldn't really do what they wanted to do. Uh, They would be stoned themselves. And when they brought them, (coughs) they set them before the council. This would be the Sanhedrin, basically. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach uh, in this name, boy, that, what name was that? The name of Jesus. 
And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. You're trying to put us on a guilt trip. He says, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, and this is a great statement, we ought to obey God rather than man. And folks, we are seeing today government officials and so forth that are now coming down and they're saying that, uh, that you can preach whatever you want in church, but just don't go outside the church. You can, go, you can uh, uh, actually, they're going, the next thing that's going to happen is uh, we're going to stand against a lot of these issues. Well, we're just going to preach the Bible. Let's put it that way. And we're not going to waver. Adultery is adultery. Um, stealing is stealing. Uh, we're going to preach the simple gospel and so forth. And, uh, but that's going to get us in trouble. Because God did say, male and female created he them. And God did say, and that was one of the first things he did, I mean, that's creation. But the first institution he set up was male and female shall leave their male and female fathers and mothers and cling to themselves. And that's the that's a basic institution uh, of societies that are, that whenever, all throughout history has shown when you have strong marriages, you have strong societies. When you have weak marriages, you have very weak and wicked societies. And so, you know, it doesn't matter what the uh, University of Pennsylvania or whatever says, a girl's a girl and a guy's a guy. But unfortunately, we got people now in government that says, if you teach that, then, then we're going to come in on you. Folks, we've got to preach what God says. But, the th but, but there again, those are secondary issues. The main thing is we're going to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because notice what they did. And this, remember what, what the Lord told Peter upon, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. All the way through the book of Acts, we begin with that issue. And notice what Peter does now again, and this is what you will see through the book of Acts. Peter said to the, and the other apostles together, they said, we ought to obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, the resurrection. If Christ be not raised, we are all men most miserable. First and foremost, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Whom you murdered, yes, crucified, raised again. Now, isn't it interesting how that Peter uh, says this, or, or whoever an apostle says, all the apostles, but he says, you killed him. You are guilty. Now, a lot of people say, oh, so the Jews were the Christ killers. No, we were the Christ killers because God died for us, and it was our sins that, that he died on the cross for. The Jews just happened to be some of the instruments along with the Romans. But we see you murdered, and you crucified him you hung him on a tree him now is raised up and God has highly exalted him and he sits at the right hand of God the prince and that is obviously he's not he is equal with God and savior he's the messiah and to give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins there's the gospel all right there that Jesus Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures that he uh, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. That's all the gospel. If Christ be not raised, then we are all men most miserable. The great thing about it is that he is now at the right hand, that he is with God the Father, and he judges the world. He is the prince. And we saw that word, I mean, actually, he's the author, and we know that he's the author of our salvation, same word. He's the one who even gave us the ability to want to be saved. And so we see that this is the, this is the crux. And so folks, I don't want, and I mentioned those areas that we're going to be, uh, that we're going to be, if the world keeps going the way it is, we're going to have some problems in the near future. But the one thing that uh, we want people to know, even when we preach, is that we serve as a Savior. Now, we're not going to get off on condemning everybody all the time about and preaching all the time about those type sins other than the fact that, uh, that I serve a risen Savior and I got a better way to live. Amen? We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. 
I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of care. And just the time I need him, he's always there. Why? Because I, he is my personal savior. And that's what we want anyone to have. And we can't change people's lifestyles until we change our hearts. And we can't change our hearts. Only Jesus Christ can do that. So we are responsible for the message of that Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, that he rose again. And unfortunately, there's a lot of churches that don't preach that. And so, yes, we're going to be very unpopular. And there's churches right here in town that, uh, that I can't have fellowship with because and just some of the things that are going on, but they don't believe they're a risen Savior. And if they don't believe a risen Savior, they don't have a real bona fide church either because they're not even Christians. And so that is the central theme of the book of Acts. Hey, listen, Jesus Christ died for your sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, that he rose again. And if we don't have any of that, then let's, well, let's go off and join those crowds because after all, let's eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow we're going to die anyway. But if I accept the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to live forever. But by the way, all of us are going to live forever someplace. And I would much rather live with, at the, at the right, with the Lord Jesus in heaven than with the devil and all the people in hell, wouldn't you? And so we see that, um, that this is the message that Peter is going to preach. Now, we see that uh, and they, we were witnesses of these things. And so also the Holy Spirit, whom God hath given to those who obey him. So there's, there's our power. The Holy Spirit has given to those who obey him. The Holy Spirit didn't uh, come and get by tongues. No, the moment you were saved, you obeyed him. And the first act of obedience is when the Lord Jesus says, Christ said, come unto me, and you came unto him. And you were given the Holy Spirit. It wasn't a special act. It wasn't a double blessing and you got, saved, you got the Holy Spirit later. No, you got salvation when you believed in him. Now, we see the third phase now. We see, so they're, they're still jawing back and forth, but it's going to get tighter. Gamil, Gamil is one of those interesting men in Scripture. Actually, he is the disciple of Helial. Helial was the main rabbi back before the Lord Jesus Christ came. And it really, he was the one who, um, that the Lord uh, disagreed with about even the area of marriage. Halal was uh, the guy who brought in this easy, easy divorceism to, uh, to the Jewish country and so forth, the Jewish culture. And uh, the Lord rebuked that very strongly in, uh, in Matthew chapter 19. But uh, it got to the point where the Jew can tell his wife, um, I divorce thee, I divorce thee, I divorce thee. And she was gone. She had no, no rights whatsoever. He could, well, why did you divorce her? She burnt my toast this morning. You know, just idiot things like that. And so the women were being treated horribly by some of these, some of these uh, doctrines that were coming from people like Halil. Now, Gamaliel was his main disciple. And actually, in the mission of the day, both Halil and Gamaliel are mentioned as far as some of the conduct of Jews. Now, Halal wasn't bad in all areas. He's a pretty good man in a lot of areas, like a lot of people. But uh, when, it got, when it came to the Messiah and so forth, or to righteousness, he, he erred in a lot of areas. But the Mishnah is just uh, one of the extra books of the Jews today. And any man-made book is going to have errors in it. But Gamaliel now, is, is, uh, one, is, he is the main theologian of this age. And so he's in Jerusalem. And when they heard that they wanted to kill him, in verse 33, then one of the council stood up, a Pharisee, uh, no, he's a Pharisee, not a Sadducee, named Gamaliel, a teacher that, uh, of the law held in high respect by all the people and commanded them to put the, the apostles outside for a little while. So said, listen, let me talk to you and let's get rid of these apostles for a while. And then he goes and he says, you know, really, you, if this is just a passing fad, what's going to happen is the same thing that happened. He's going to name a couple of men, one's Judas and, uh, and, and uh, Judas of Galilee. And these guys rebelled 
And they led, they, they were talking about false messiahs and so forth, but they all went by the wayside. And really, this, if this is a passing fad, this is what's going to happen with these people. So let's just let them be for a while. Now, aren't you glad he was wrong? You know, so they actually listened to him. And we see that, um, notice in verse 29, but as, if this is a, of God, you cannot overthrow it lest you even be found to fight against God. So you're saying, really, if this is of God, then, uh, then you're not going to be able to overthrow it. Now, him being a Pharisee, that's a kind of a, an interesting situation uh, here. But they listened to him. And uh, verse 40, and they agreed with him. And when they had called the apostles and had now noticed how it's getting worse, they flogged them. Now, Whenever they beat them, they just didn't take a little belt out and put red marks on them. It was like the Lord Jesus. He was scourged. I mean, when they, they beat you, they left not only marks, but they took chunks of skin out of you. And so these men were beaten horribly. And we see that the, the Bible says that they should not speak. No, they just could not stand the name of Jesus. And so we see that... Uh, uh, and, and so they they beat them uh, and told him not to speak his name and let them go. The next step is going to be killing. And so we see how it's going downhill. So they departed from the presence of the council. Notice the reaction. And rejoicing and counting it worthy to suffer for the, uh, the shame of his name. You know, say shame for his name, shame of his name. One of the things that uh, the world does, you know, is they don't want to hear the name of the Lord Jesus and they want to shame you for believing it. And we see that uh, this is exactly what they're trying to do with him. One of the things that uh, tyrants do, whether it was Nero who blamed a lot of the problems in Rome on Christians and on Jews, but also even in World War II, back in the 1930s, Stalin and Hitler, they came after Christians and blamed them for a lot of the problems. And of course, if they stood up against the anti-Semitism, then they were really ostracized. But they, they would actually have people that would bring false charges and bring these people into courts and condemn them for all kinds of... And of course, when the government comes in on you, you only have so much money. And they have it all. And so be careful whenever you hear of Christians today that are all of a sudden being charged by some magistrate or something for some hideous charge. Now, there's a lot of bad people out there. But let's let, and uh, I'm just saying, be careful and let's have due process. I believe that, you know, as a, if it's a pastor or some spiritual leader, yes, they're going to be judged and they rightly so. But there's going to be a lot of false charges coming up soon. And one of the things that I've tried, and you know, you people working with me know what I, I take extra caution to make sure that if it is brought up against us, that you can laugh at it because you know it's not true. Uh, I really praise the Lord for a couple of our men. One of our, he's asking me often, okay, now pastor, is this, because why? Because we want to make sure that these things, that, that if they bring charges against us, they're going to be false. Amen. If I say anything, I tell you ladies when I'm working around you, if I say anything that sounds off color, let my wife or somebody know because it is open mouth foot stick. But I, uh, we're going to cut that kind of stuff off at the, because I want it to be uh, where, again, I praise the Lord, good old Nancy. And she said, Pastor, I didn't understand you at all to begin with, but now I understand it. And she says, now I can almost laugh at anybody who would ever say anything about you. Well, she worked very closely with us quite for years here. Well, that's the way I want it. And that's the way we, folks, that's why we got to be above reproach in all of our lives. We don't want, we don't want to give occasion to Satan to say anything. But, they, but you can imagine, the, the, curse, the curses are going to come. The shame is going to come. The false charges are going to come because that's what the devil does, doesn't he? But the great thing about it, I like what uh, Richard Rumbrandt, who was a Romanian back in the, uh, after World War II, preaching the gospel, the communism came in, Iron Curtain and so forth. 
But uh, when he was thrown in prison, time after time, and it's the mental anguish that he went through, sorrow, but the rotting out, just uh, all kinds of things that were happening. But uh, it was amazing how that, uh, if you read anything about the man, he talks about how the him in, and all he would do is witness to him, slap him up, and just delivered him out of the Corey Ten Boom the same way. They just opened up the uh, the gates and let her out, and they don't, and to this day, or to that day when she passed away, she never knew why the Lord just let her out of after she'd been persecuted so much. You, time after time, you see God's people. I think of a missionary who was talking to Roman Simeons and one of our missionaries that we supported in former ministry. But he went back to China. And uh, his parents were kicked out in 1949 when the communists took over. And uh, he got with some of those older men now that were just children like he was back uh, when his parents were kicked out of China. And they were coming out of the woodwork just to see, see him vibrant Christians trying to live for the Lord, poor as dirt because of the communists, uh, and many of them had been thrown in jail and so forth. And he was sitting there talking to several of them. And all of a sudden, this teenage girl started crying. And he, he was saying, well, why are you crying? And they said, well, what's going on? And she said, every time they've come in, I've been too young to be persecuted. They haven't taken me to jail yet. You know, that's a mentality that, you know, just is, to us is weird. But can God, the Holy Spirit, give us that type of heart? Can God give us that type that we can actually rejoice in persecutions? Can we get, and this is one of the, big, the biggest tests that we're going to ever have, is the very command that the Lord gives us. And remember the Beatitudes? The Beatitudes were all be happy attitudes. There were things, although he says blessed in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11. Blessed, which means happy. Happy are you when, you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. That's the key word, falsely. We want them to lie about us if they're going to say anything, right? And so we want them to, if they're going to slander us, let's make sure it's a lie. But, but we want to be Guilty, I uh, like what uh, oh, evangelist Lester Roloff used to say. Uh, if they're going to convict me, I want it to be that they convict me of love in first degree. Well, you know, that's a, the Lord looked on them and loved them. So we love the sinner. And yet we've got to stand against the sin. And so we see that he says, and they say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice. And what's our response? Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For you're not the first person, so persecuted the prophets who were before you. I mean, they, they, uh, Isaiah was sown asunder. Jeremiah, of course, was thrown in jail and suffered. Daniel was thrown in the lion's den. You name the prophets. They had their problems. But aren't you glad you served the same God that Daniel served and Isaiah served? And so can we really thank God and in the times of persecution, can we praise him? One of the worst things that each one of us go through is when our own personal friends or our loved ones or the people we work with sneer at us or whatever. That hurts, doesn't it? But can we actually turn that to rejoicing and saying at least they see something in me? And Lord, if they see it in me, may they see you living within me and I and praise God that they see something I would hate to know that uh, uh, someone living in the just some of the lifestyles that we talked about would come into this church and not feel any difference than anything out in the world now I want them to feel and I love it when they say my your church is friendly your church is warm all those things but I I also like it whenever they say but your church is so strict Praise the Lord. You know, I don't know if we're strict or not. I mean, you know, uh, I had one again. I love it whenever our people, they, they come to my defense. 
Oh, your church is so strict. And that woman, she, <laughs> she started laughing. And she said, they don't even know what strict is. You know, so you love that whenever your people know what's going on, but the world doesn't. But that's the way it should be, shouldn't it? The disciples knew what was going on. The people knew what was going on. Though those Sadducees and Pharisees, or Sadducees especially here, were totally blind to the gospel that was right there before them. Were the, should we get angry at them? No, we should pity them. We looked on, at them as sinners on their way to hell. Oh, that God would give us that joy, that God would give us that grace to be able to smile at Satan's rage and face a frowning world. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Change us by it, Lord. May the world see that there's a difference in us. And Lord, we pray for the world. We pray for our relatives. We think of people that we pray for by name here. Oh, Lord, we know that they're going to be, as you convict them through the power of your spirit, how that uh, they are going to get more honoring until they get saved. But we pray, Lord, that we'll, we will rejoice in spite of the consternation. We pray, Lord, that you would give us wisdom in this very evil age. Lord, we've got to stand against so many things, and yet, Lord, in our own personal lives, with our families, the confusion, people that are leaving the faith, uh, the people that we thought knew you, and now they're living lives of sin, and they look at us as, as dummies or whatever. Lord, we just we live in a confused age. But may we realize that we serve a risen Savior and that you are the one who gives us the power. You're the rock that we, have for, that we can stand upon, the stability that we can enjoy, the peace that we can have. But Father, may we present your gospel in a way that would be pleasing to you, realizing that you are the one who has to call people to repentance. You are the one who has to turn people from darkness to light. But Lord, may we bravely and boldly and unashamedly carry forth that message to a lost and dying world, to our relatives, to our neighbors. And Lord, may others see you living in us. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's take our hymnals, 474.